So we will turn now to Ephesians, the first chapter, and uh, begin with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. This is a traditional opening statement by Paul because his he knew that he was sent by Jesus Christ. Apostle means one who is sent. And he knew that he was sent by the will of God. The Father and the Son always work together. Every aspect of Christ's work was in done in communion and connection with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. This is the theme, a very important theme of Ephesians. You'll find in Christ Jesus and expressions such as that, in whom and in him, uh, throughout the first two chapters especially, but even beyond that, chapters 3 and onward. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, familiarly um, and consistently Paul uh, refers to God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Now this does not mean the Father is divine and the Son is not because when he speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ he's talking about our divine um, head and director and leader. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now I've discussed this before but we'll briefly mention it again. This chapter Ephesians 1 contains the most complete uh, treatment of, of um, predestination in the Bible. And always predestination is in Christ Jesus or in Him and so forth. We have not yet come to the introduction of predestination itself but we are moving toward it verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, the Father has chosen us in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Now, there are many who believe we're predestined from before we were ever born, from the foundation of the world, and that's true. But the concept of predestination is false. The, the first chapter of Ephesians the, uh, pre uh, presents Christ as uh, predestining us in himself. The Father has predestined uh, us in Christ, which means that all who are in Christ Jesus which is the primary theme of this chapter, are predestined to life. Which means that those who are not in Jesus are not predestined to life. And this is not a double predestination. It's a single predestination because all are predestined to death. We are all I should say not predestined because that is a false concept. We are all under the sentence of death. There's only one way we can escape that and that is in Christ Jesus. Now in Christ Jesus is not a spatial concept but a, a relational concept. Uh, Gary Are we not, because God has made a way, has God, is it not, I, I understood predestination is that it's God's intention 
that humanity be saved. We are predestined to be saved. We choose not to be saved because God, through our life, presents himself to us through the Holy Spirit. And in that hardening, softening process, we either listen to the Holy Spirit or we harden our hearts against the Holy Spirit. But I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that what I believe is it's correct, yes. Well, uh, that is, uh, I would say, uh, I appreciate uh, your effort to uh, to take the responsibility from God for the lost because we are predestined. But I think there's another element to predestination and that is that there is a guarantee in predestination. It isn't simply a choice. It is a guarantee that those who make the choice will live. In other words, um, if we are in Christ Jesus, we are saved. And as long as we're in him, we are in a saved condition, no matter what problems we face or how much ignorance yet has to be dispelled. But those who do not receive Christ are not in him and are lost. And I think that is pretty much what you're saying, except that I believe that there is that predetermined position. In other words, if you're in him, God is predetermined that you will be saved. Not just that you're given a choice, but you've already made a choice to be in him. And in him you are saved and safe. According as he has chosen us in him, now verse 4, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now this is a very important statement because it reaffirms the in him uh, principle but notice we are chosen in him. Everyone who's in him is chosen and the decision was made before the foundation of the world that those who are in him will be holy and without blame before him in love and this is an important statement in love because this is really the essence of perfection. Perfection, we are made perfect in love. And in him who is a source of love is the same when, we, when he refers to in him then he is actually referring to in love as well even though only occasionally he does mention that. Then having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Paul intensely focuses upon God's will. And you'll notice how several places this is including uh, predestinated us unto adoption by Christ Jesus to himself. So the predestination is to a person, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his, that is, the Father's will. And notice we're predestined to adoption. Who is it that God is going to adopt as children? those that are in Christ. And uh, so that adoption here is shown to be a pre product of being in Christ. So if you're in Christ, you are adopted. Yes. I, um, I, I think I, I got my idea from Romans chapter 8 um, where it says for whom he did foreknow he also he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The idea that God foreknew all of us before we were ever born. 
And it's his intention that through Christ, salvation is offered to all. And then at that point, whether we make a choice or not, to choose Christ. And what if I'm, we... What I'm, what I'm struggling with is the idea that before we ever existed, God has predestined that, uh, well, uh, he predestined that if we accept Christ, we will be saved. Okay. Oh. So, <laughs> so not everyone is predestined to be saved, but everyone who chooses Christ is predestined to be saved. And that is the key rather than knowledge or uh, experience. Uh, the key is those who choose Christ and to be in Christ means to be in intimate fellowship with him and be surrendered to his will and of those they are predestined to be holy and without blame now to be holy is not really the same as to be righteous to be holy means to be set aside for, uh, to God, for becoming righteous. And the word uh, sanctification has come to include both of those thoughts. But the basic concept of holy uh, and of sanctification is separation from the world. To be separate to choose a life committed to Christ which is separate from the world. So we cannot, uh, and James says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. So the love of Christ leads us to abandon the world and that is what is meant by holiness. We choose to separate from the world and therefore we are in a state of holiness, of separation. And then as separation, it is in love which is the purifying agent. Therefore separation or um, sanctification does mean uh, involve cleansing because that is the result of being in a state of love. The last verse, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. Now notice we are predestinated to adoption and we are adopted if we are responding to Christ and his will. It says according to the good pleasure of his will. So it is our own choice whether we <coughs> shall choose adoption. To choose holiness or separation from the world is paramount to, to choosing to be adopted. And those who are adopted become his children in a second and special way. The Bible says uh, that they that are born of the flesh are of flesh, and those that are born of the spirit uh, are spirit. So when we're born the first time, we're born of the flesh, and we are children of God in that sense, and so there is a sense in which all mankind uh, are God's children. But uh, for him to recognize them as children, they must uh, make a choice. And that choice is a choice to be holy, to be separate from the world. A choice to deny self is a choice to deny the things of the world. And this is what causes us to receive the adoption that God would like to give to everyone, but can only give to those that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us acceptable in the beloved. 
Now notice we are not acceptable in ourselves. We may be children of God uh, by natural birth. And he certainly loves us and uh, does everything he can for us. But to be acceptable to the Father means that the bridge has been crossed, the bridge of sin, which makes a gulf between us and, and the Father uh, that can be crossed only through Christ. His body is the bridge that by which we can cross over from death to life. Again, verse 7 begins with, In whom? Accepted in the beloved, that is in Christ, in whom we have redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein, that means in grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now the mystery of his will, can I ask you now what is that mystery? The mystery of his will. Christ in you the hope of glory? Is it Christ in you the hope of glory? Yes, Christ in you the hope of glory. But uh, it also specifically identifies what Paul does with, with the Gentiles, Christ in the Gentiles. So that the you is not just referring to Jewish people, <coughs> but uh, the Christ in you would mean anyone who chooses Christ. And that's why Paul says, if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he proposed in himself before the world began. So actually, what this really means is that before the world began, Christ proposed with the Father, they had the agreement that they would save all mankind. All men who would accept Christ. Now, as a first stage, they chose a nation through which they, they could reveal themselves to the world. A Jewish nation failed in its function to do what it, they were called to do and as a result they were given uh, 490 years to uh, to uh, accomplish that and to be ready for Christ and instead when he came they crucified him and uh, it was a good pleasure of his will which was proposed in himself that means he alone was responsible for that relationship and uh, those, no matter what nation, who accepted him were in Christ Jesus, therefore uh, were predestined before the beginning of the world to be saved. Because when God gave man the power of will, he also committed himself to the salvation of those with that will should they depart from, from his plan. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Now I had planned to put a little coloring on all of the in Christ, but I, as far as I went, I still had time and didn't realize it, but I spent my time elsewhere. <laughs> but in Christ, you know, over and over again, in Christ. Now it notices both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So Christ is the one who unites the heavenly family with the earthly family, and within the earthly family, all nations of the world. So that everything is in Christ, in whom 
we have life. Verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. How do we inherit the promises of Abraham? In Christ. Only in Christ. If we're Jews, that doesn't mean anything anymore. Because a Jew is, uh, it, it, we're still, God loves us, but it's only in Christ that he's able to, uh, to reveal his love in a special way. And then it says, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. That is an interesting verse and significant because it shows that even for those uh, those who are predestinated because they're in Christ uh, still all things must be worked according to God's will because there's much that will have to be changed within us but even our sinfulness and our sins God can use that to teach us our dependence on Christ if we choose to that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Notice the purpose of God is that we be to the praise of his glory, which is his character. Therefore, the whole purpose of God is to restore in us the character of Christ and restore his glory. And uh, those who first trusted in Christ uh, were doing so and whoever else trusted in Christ would also. In whom, again, notice all of the in him, in whom, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now, remember that Paul is speaking to the Ephesians who are, uh, were a pagan people and he raised up the church among them. So all of what Paul is talking to are uh, basically are people who would be called Gentiles, the nations. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, when we believe, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. It is only through faith that we can gain the victory. And uh, notice that verse four explain, 14 explains what the sealing, of the initial sealing involves, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the uh, purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Again, we are not to receive the glory. Always it's his glory. But what does this earnest mean? Which is the earnest of our inheritance. Tell me, what does that word earnest mean? I don't know if I have mentioned here uh, in this class but maybe uh, you, brother, have heard me use this illustration. But the earnest, I, uh, it helped me to understand by the experience when I was a small boy of uh, going with my father into a service station without money, but being able to get gas. <laughs> he had a a jack, a very fine jack, a very strong jack. And he would come to the service station and say, well, I have no money, but if you fill my gas tank, I will leave my jack here as uh, evidence that I will return and pay for the gas. The earnest is a down payment or a means of barter whereby you are assured 
whereby he has assured that the rest will come. Now, we always, my father always returned as soon as he got any money and got his jack back. And uh, that uh, assurance was his jack. That was his um, his down payment, his, his, uh, his means of assuring that he would be back to pay for it. And in each case he was. The jack was worth quite a bit more than the, than the gas was worth. So if he had not come back, then the station man, the, the gas man would have kept the jack and it would have been his. But as it was, it was merely a down payment or a means of, uh, uh, of assuring of the, the rest. Now, when God seals us to begin with, it is a down payment, assurance that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it in the day of Jesus Christ. Now, Ephesians 1.15 Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all his saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention for you of you in my prayers. Uh, notice that Paul routinely uh, is praying for those of his uh, churches that he has raised up. If he hears good things, he prays for them. If he hears that they are in trouble, he prays for them. And this is something we can pray for each other, whether the individuals we're praying for are going through good times or bad. Uh, but Paul was always praying. He says, I cease not to give thanks for you, and I give thanks to God for my Czech brothers, for instance, because I not only heard from a distance, but saw how God was protecting and leading his sincere people in circumstances in which leadership uh, is consistently seeking to undermine uh, and to lead them a different way. But they have uh, continued in faith, and, and I shall be praying for them regularly. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Notice the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Wisdom, true wisdom comes through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom as we focus upon Christ and it's in the revelation of the knowledge of him. The more we know of Christ, <laughs> what he's done for us, what he is doing for us, the more grateful we become and the more uh, intensely are we, uh, um, int more in intimately are we associated with him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So, the eyes of your understanding, of course, is a figure of speech, uh, but it gives an eyes to our mind to see that which we could not see otherwise. Paul says that spiritual things are only spiritually discerned unless their eyes in our understanding to see, we will not be able to see it. And that is why those who are not truly converted uh, cannot see. And they cannot appreciate that which those who are uh, in union with Christ do see. <clears throat> that ye may know what is the hope of his calling our only hope is in the calling of God and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So the riches of the glory of his inheritance, the inheritance 
would mean of his children or adopted, but the hope lies in the riches of his glory in those who inherit an inheritance of his saints. Verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? And again, his mighty power is wrought in us through the Holy Spirit, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. <coughs> Verse 22, has put all things under his feet, as the Father had placed everything under Christ's feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So Christ is the head of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and in all. It is Christ's desire that his body be uh, a temple, that, uh, that the church itself be a temple for the living God, and that his body actually reveal uh, himself to the world in a fullness that fills all and in all. Now chapter 2 begins with uh, expression of the new birth. And you hath he quickened, or made alive. And this is the purpose of the new birth, which is also equivalent to resurrection from the dead. Who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Now we mentioned holiness is separation, and is separation from the course of this world. It's not separation from the earth. It's not separation from the people of, that are not Christians. It's separating from the course of this wor world. God intends for us to have contact with those who are not his uh, newborn children and to introduce them to him, but they cannot and we cannot while we are practicing the, the course of the world. We must be separate from the world in order to draw them out of the world. According to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh. So among whom now has to do with before we we're talking about in whom, meaning in Christ, now we're talking about in uh, the uh, spirit of disobedience, and uh, which is Satan. Among whom also we had our conversation. Now, what does that word conversation mean? Conversation. Among whom we had our conversation. Anyone? Those who are interacting with? Pardon? Those who we interact with? Uh, yes. Basically, the word conversation means our world, uh, our world lifestyle, and would have to do with what you just mentioned. But our con conversation, in today's language, conversation means to talk together. But actually, conversation then, in the scriptures, has to do with our lifestyle, our conversation. So it says, uh, among whom we all had our conversation, our way of life. 
in times past in the lusts of our flesh. So our basic way of life was to, before Christ, was to uh, uh, respond to our fleshly impulses. Among the, the uh, conversation in times past in the lusts or desires of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and in that case the mind controlled by the flesh, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now Paul is speaking of we, meaning both he as a Jew and the, the Gentiles. Uh, before conversion, there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, and we always will seek to fulfill our own fleshly desires. Ephesians 2, 4, But God, who is rich in his mercy for his great love, wherewith he has loved us. I may have mentioned some time before, but my mother used to say, we are rich children, we are rich. At a time when we had almost nothing to eat. <laughs> And uh, when at a time when we had no money to buy clothes with, and uh, yet uh, she said we are rich, and we really were rich. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, my parents were revealing to us on a daily basis the love of God because they were receiving it and we received it through them and were thus enriched by it. Even when we were dead in sins hath he quickened us together with Christ. If it were not true that he makes us alive when we're dead in sins we would never change. But it is even when we're dead in sins that we need to be resurrected to a new life. And it is to those who are dead in sins that he offers to quicken us together with Christ, which really refers to Christ's resurrection as assurance of our own spiritual resurrection. For by grace you are saved and has raised up us together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, there is not the evidence for it quite yet, but later we will see that when it speaks of together, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. So, we have the theme throughout Ephesians. In fact, I was going to begin by a statement, and I will do so now, that uh, nearly half of Paul's works focus on Jew-Gentile issues, assuring that the mystery of God, uh, which is Christ in the Gentiles, and of course in, in you, in all of us, but the uh, bringing together of the Jews and Gentiles in one, so that he raises up together with himself and with each other, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now notice, this is not a, a, a spatial concept of our literal being in heaven. It's a spiritual concept of intimacy and close relationship. And God wants us to think of ourselves not in citizens of this world, but citizens of heaven. And in numerous places, Paul emphasizes that we are sitting together with Christ in heaven if we are faithful to him. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness to us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, this not of works is, was his primary uh, theme in Galatians. And it had specifically to do with the fact that we are not saved in, by Christ because 
we uh, accept uh, um, circumcision, but because of our relationship to Christ. For we are his workmanship. He is his workmanship. Now, when you uh, uh, see the workmanship of a cabinet maker, what do you see? You see the products that he has uh, done, whether they're uh, cupboards or perhaps chairs or whatever the, uh, the person is making, you see his work through his finished product and this is what God wants to be revealed. It says, for we are his workmanship, we're the product of his work created in Christ Jesus. Notice there again, in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Those who are predestined then are predestined in Christ and they're predestined to good works. So good works are not legalistic if those works are in relation to Christ, in Christ. Verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles of the flesh, and by the way, here's where we first introduce specifically the issue, remember that you, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcised by that which is called the circumcision in flesh made with the hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. When we go out to win people to Christ, we must remember they have no hope. If they do not know Christ yet, they have no hope. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes or at one time were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So that just as with the Jew who is in Christ Jesus, now the Gentile has the same privilege. But he needs to remember where he has come from and what has resulted from his becoming a Christian. Now verse 14, For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. This specifically refers now to the Jew-Gentile gulf. With the Jews, the Gentiles were not even considered to be savable. And uh, now he is our peace who has made both Jews and Gentiles one and has broken down the middle wall of partition that the Jews have built up between them. Yes. I, I was going to ask that was a Jewish construct. It was God's intention that the Jews were supposed to sp spread the gospel to those around them, but they chose to isolate themselves, and therefore they were the ones that set up the idea that the Gentiles could not be saved. Yes. It was not from God. Yes. As a matter of fact, it was completely opposite God's will. And uh, it was uh, the result of that, such things as that, that they were so satisfied with the ritual, thinking that they were saved because of their ritual, that they denied and destroyed the one to whom the uh, ritual pointed. <clears throat> Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Now what is the enmity? even the law of commandments as contained in ordinances. Now ordinances are not to be confused with uh, uh, principles of constitution. We have a constitution of the United States and every ordinance is to be judged by that constitution but the 
the decisions of, of the Congress are never uh, understood in the same way that the Constitution itself. So that always there is a, a court, um, state Supreme Court, and uh, the National Supreme Court, the purpose of that court is to measure every uh, bylaw, <coughs> every um, ordinance of Congress by that, and the, the courts have the power to strike down Congress congressional law when it does not comport with the Constitution. Now the courts have no right to strike down any part of the Constitution. Their responsibility is to maintain uh, the integrity of the Constitution itself and therefore when they strike something down, the only basis for doing it is, is established by the Constitution itself. contain an ordinance for to make in himself, notice in Christ, in himself, one of the twain, of the two, one new man, and so making peace, that is peace between Jews and Gentiles. So what Christ came to do was to do away with the law, that is the ceremonial law, uh, which uh, the Jews had used not to point to Christ, but to, to separate themselves uh, in a self-righteous manner from the, the people they were to witness to. And that he might reconcile both unto God, that is, both Jew and Gentile, in one body by the cross, having, having ex slain the enmity thereby. And in this, I want to come back to what I started to say a while ago. Uh, nearly half of all Paul's letters uh, deal with the Jew-Gentile issue. Now, it's obvious when we're dealing with Galatians and Romans, it makes it very clear, but Ephesians and Colossians are just as truly a part of Paul's basic argument that the Gentiles are saved on the same basis that Jews are saved and neither one are based upon the law of circumcision and the ritual law. Because circumcision, which is frequently mentioned, is the entry right into the whole Jewish uh, ordinance, you might say. And he came, this is Christ, and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. Now he's speaking of Gentile world as being afar off because they knew nothing about the gospel because the Israelites had not shared it with them. And those who are nigh are those who had access to scriptures. For through him, that is Christ, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Here, the Holy Spirit's role is specifically mentioned. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So not only are we individually to be temples of the Holy Spirit, but God's purpose is that his church be a temple in which people can worship the true God in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So you also here would mean the individuals who are designed to be a habitation or a temple, a dwelling place for a God through what? Through the Spirit. 
Now this uh, is the end of chapter 2 and I'd ask you to do Colossians 1 and 2 but instead I prepared Ephesians. We uh, have a little time now. Do you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make? I, I just noticed in verse 20 it says Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Yes. It's a refutation of the idea that Peter's the chief. Yes, that's and also uh, the chief cornerstone was referred to in the Old Testament and identified with Jehovah, Yahweh. So Yahweh is Christ. Uh, Christ is the chief cornerstone. And when he said, you are Petros, he didn't say you are Petra. He said, you are Petros. And upon this Petra, I will build my church. Now Petros is also means stone, but it has to do with the kind of stones you might throw in a sling, uh, small stones. And Petra is a feminine form, and for some reason the Greeks decided to use the feminine form for major uh, building blocks. and. Christ was the Petra, not Petros. You are Petros, and upon this Petra I will build my church. And he referring in that case to himself. And in doing so, he identified himself as the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Well, young folk, are there any other questions or observations? Let me say it once more, that Paul's theology is built around the Jew-Gentile issue. Half, almost half of his letters deal directly with it, including Hebrews, uh, which some question whether that's Paul. Um, as a matter of fact, not only does Ellen White the um, identify it as Paul's, but the message of, of Hebrews certainly is the same message that Paul was so constantly focused upon in his letters. Now let me explain something else that may be of interest. And by the way, Brother Henry, <laughs> I at least twice have transgressed. <laughs> and realized it only afterward. Uh, and not only are just about half of his letters um, focused on the Jew-Gentile issue, which is the mystery that he was, per, uh, was uh, called as an apostle to present to the whole world. But the only letters uh, that do not contain this are the ones that had to do with more personal dealing with personal individuals like Timothy and Titus. And even those have some shades uh, of this, but Corinthians, which is, uh, we have both letters which really deal with the Corinthian problems, and those problems were not Jew Gentile problems, they were problems of the Jews, or of the, of the church members reverting to the Gentile ways of life, infidelity and so forth. So virtually all of the general letters that Paul wrote dealt with the Gen Jew Gentile issue. And there can be no question but what Paul's theology was focused on the covenant transfer from Jews to the Gentiles in which the Gentiles, the Jews, are still capable of being one of the nations. So they have, are not left out, but no longer do they have the prominence. Any other question? Shall we bow our heads? Father, thank you so much for your many blessings. We thank you for Paul's ministry 
and for his commitment to the gospel to all the world. The mystery that had been kept secret from the beginning that was made known through him. Pray that you'll help us to have the same burden for the world and that we may do what we can to bring salvation, that is, to bring Christ to all. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, we actually took the whole time. I thought we'd be through, and I was kind of hoping we would be through. <laughs> As I am still involved with the... Um, jet lag. Jet lag. And um, 